Um, welcome. Uh, uh, it's great to have you here for the Institute for Humanities Research Book Award. We do this every year. Um, every other year, it's an internal person. It's a faculty member from ASU. Uh, they submit their, their books, and um, it's adjudicated by, by a, um, uh, an award committee. And then on the other years, it's an external person. So next year will be external. This year, we have the pleasure of an in internal candidate. So um, let me say a, a few words then uh, a, a about uh, Patrick. Is You can think Samuel Beckett and modernism, Nietzsche, a little known travel writer, Kathleen Murphy, and Irish historian Standish O'Grady's writing on the mythic hero Kukulian. Patrick Bixby is a man of many skills and diverse thinking and now licensed to travel, a cultural history of the passport. And having written for the Wall Street Journal, Fortune, uh, The Conversation, he turns this kind of accessible writing to the birth, standardization, and now the necessity of a passport. And I'm happy to say that part of this came from uh, the IHR ran a series of uh, how to write for publics. And this was a way for him to begin to think about turning from academic writing and that skill set of research into how to translate that for a broader audience. Uh, the award committee uh, includes, uh, included these comments. Who are we? And where are we allowed to wonder, to seek refuge, or simply be? In License to Travel, Patrick Bixby investigates the ways passports and the regimes that create them seek to answer those questions. Ranging broadly through time and space, Bixby explores archives, works of literature, films, and even internet myths in this highly engaging work that insists we contemplate how passports, those small but powerful books generate and foreclose possibilities. Indeed, License to Travel received unanimous high praise from the committee, both for its uh, academic investigation, that kind of research that's needed to make this possible, as well as its accessibility. From uh, uh, the Athenian Agora to the Han China, through Europe in the 18th century era of the Grand Tour. From uh, Frederick Douglass to Herman Melville and James Joyce to Sun Ra uh, and Salman Rushdie and even David Bowie. Uh, so it's an, it's an absolutely sweeping uh, look at the role of travel and passport. As the London School of Economics Review explains, uh, Bixby's license to travel gives passports stories of human quality. The anecdotes conveyed through the words of writers and artists across different times offers personal, less abstract stories that counter attempts to anonymize refugees as flows or invasions. And so to end this uh, with uh, Patrick's own words, now more than ever, we are our documents. They tell the world who we are, where we come from, and where we can go. Please uh, join me in congratulating and welcoming Patrick all the way from West Campus <laughs> to us here today. And Patrick, we want to recognize you. <laughs> so rarely do we get a trophy. You know, we get these plaques, we get, That's you know. That's amazing. So, well done, sir. <laughs> As I was saying, I feel like I won the bowling league. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess I'll, I'll put this over here. Yeah, <laughs> yeah <laughs> drive around town with that. Thank you so much, Ron, yeah. um, for, for the introduction and for the lovely trophy and for this uh, entire occasion. I, I really appreciate it. I did want, if we could, to just take a moment to acknowledge the lives lost in the Middle East this past week. It bears on what I'm going to say a little bit, and I think it's uh, something we should have on our minds in any case. So, um, okay, but turning to my, my talk, to uh, translate Ron's instructions about what I should address today, he said something along the lines of tell us how the sausage was made. 
<laughs> Although, of course, Ron wouldn't use such a crass <laughs> metaphor, something more vegan, perhaps. <laughs> um, but it's true that the writing process can be a bit gory uh, if looked at too closely, perhaps even more in the context of the emotional, intellectual, and all too literal slaughterhouse of the pandemic years when I wrote this book. So as the acknowledgments of the book say, and I, I want to reiterate here, the idea for License to Travel came to me before the world had closed down uh, in the midst of the pandemic. But by the time that I sat down to write the book, and I did so in a rather hastily arranged home office with a card table and a folding chair and my kids in the next room doing online schooling and all that, we were living in a different reality where nation states around the world had begun to close borders, restrict internal movement and require quarantines for visitors and returning citizens alike. Our collective freedom of movement was being restricted in fundamental and pervasive ways. So it was a strange time uh, at this moment of global immobility to be thinking about the long history of travel documentation. It's more a little strange uh, to be writing about the wanderers that uh, Ron mentioned that make up the stories in the book, uh, to be rel reliving their experiences of crossing borders and spanning cultures while being obliged myself to sit still. But it was also in a curious way, a perfect occasion for reflecting on the significance of these travels, these uh, instances of mobility and migration and dislocation. But before I get into all of that, I wanna say a little bit about the beginnings of the project, um, which might be interesting to some of those in the room who are thinking about their next book project. Um, it was uh, a revelation to me in some ways, uh, how I managed to find my way to this uh, book. Um, so as I was conceiving the book, I was nearing the completion of another project, and we could call it my promotion book, this giant 130,000 word study of Friedrich Nietzsche's ideas and how they circulated in Ireland in the first half of the 20th century and helped to promote the emergence of a uniquely Irish brand of literary modernism. Uh, so the book takes on the fraught history of that era, uh, Nietzsche's entire oeuvre, uh, the careers of W.B. Yeats, James Joyce, George Bernard Shaw, and many others. It required th sifting through a mountain, maybe several mountains of secondary literature, years of archival research, which eventually created a book that has something like 800 footnotes and citations. So this is all to say that I was ready to try something a little different <laughs> by the time I came to License to Travel. Something smart and scholarly, but with a lighter touch, let's say. Uh, I wanted to use the research and rhetorical skills that I had been honing for the last 25 years or so, I don't care to think that far back, but something like that, um, but use them in a new way and potentially for a new audience as well, which was an important part of this. I mean, this was really a matter of genre then, thinking about what I was writing in terms of a different set of conventions, a different set of expectations. I'm personally a big fan of so-called micro-histories, books that, as they say, ask large questions in small places that address the impact of certain things, famous examples being salt, coffee, paper, umbrellas, that's a nice one, uh, on their impact on human experience as well as their role in the functioning of powerful institutions. At the same time, I've been reading a number of books, and this touches on what Ron mentioned earlier from Bloomsbury's Object Lessons series. We've had the editors of that series here at the IHR. Books that give a lot of attention to seemingly simple objects, that speak to the rising interest in the history of material culture. So in short, I was becoming more and more interested in these popular genres of, of history writing and this instrumental effect and also effective relations, frankly, between people and objects. So while I was revising this massive Nietzsche and Irish modernism, I began casting around for an object that might hold my attention long enough to write a book and hopefully hold the reader's attention long enough as well. Uh, several possibilities crossed my mind, but I kept coming back round to the passport. In my own travels, uh, I've had a number of experiences with lost, stolen, um, replaced, well-used passports, uh, experiences that taught me in some cases rather viscerally just how fraught with personal significance those little documents can be. 
Now, as a scholar of modernist literature, I've also learned the crucial role that passports played in the lives and careers of writers such as James Joyce, Gertrude Stein, Langston Hughes, and many others who were among the first generation to travel under our current passport regime with its universalized and standardized requirements. When I began to look more closely at the history of passports, particularly the cultural history of passports, I realized just how generative of personal significance these documents have been, how much power these cultural artifacts have over the emotions and imaginings of those who possess them or desire to possess them. It also became clear that for all their personal significance, passports also implicate us in some of the most far-reaching transformations of modern history. The rise of the nation state, the construction of modern citizenship, the evolution of international relations, the intensification of government surveillance, and also the mounting force of cultural and economic globalization. So we can trace the precursors of the modern passport, as Ron alluded to, all the way back to the Han Dynasty in China, ancient Egypt, uh, but the archive of these documents also provides us a glimpse of, of where we're going, let's say, what uh, the accelerating pace of international travel and migration holds for us in the years to come. So passports, in that sense, are at the center of contemporary discussions about migrant crises, stateless populations, travel bans, and at the time that I was writing this, also discussions about pandemic-related travel restrictions and so forth. So, I began to conceive the book's structure in both chronological and thematic terms, aligning uh, with the evolving functions of the travel documents, as well as the transformation of the physical properties of the physical form of travel documents, from clay tablets to folded papers, and now to smart form, smartphone apps over the course of several millennia. So first, travel documents during this long history have served a facilitative function, which extends sovereign power to protect its subjects, initially in the form of royal messengers, as they travel beyond the sovereign realm to conduct trade, uh, diplomacy, and so forth. Second, as we know, these documents have come to serve an identificatory function for their bearers, so that they could vouch for who they were as they traveled. But this also meant that travelers entered into what Michel Foucault calls the field of documentation. Is that something that I'm doing? Okay. Um, which transcribed their bodies into a network of writing that allowed the mechanisms of state control to operate on them. Of course, in this way, these travel documents would also become central to the documentation and even, as I argue in the book, the conception of citizenship. Finally, passports came to serve a restrictive function limiting the ability of travelers to move across national borders. In this way, they reinforced the sovereign authority of the modern nation state in the years following the French and American revolutions and even more so after the First World War. The belligerent us and them thinking of that period re-inaugurated the use of travel documents to draw national borders more sharply than ever before in a way that, as we know, has remained with us even until today. But most intriguing to me, and this, this I suppose betrays my training, my positioning as a literary scholar and cultural historian rather than say a sociologist or political scientist who have written on the passport far more than humanists have. What intrigued me was the way that passports and their many precursors implicate individuals in these broader historical narratives about the nation state, citizenship, migration, and so forth. They are in short objects that occupy a place at the nexus of the personal and political. What I suspected and what I quickly confirmed in my research was that this unique positioning means that passports, these little books, have a capacity to tell stories uh, like few, perhaps no other archives, uh, sorry, documents in the historical archive. So I went looking for stories, trying to find interesting and often topical means to address my themes. And as I did, the scope of the book continued to grow until it became something I, I really didn't anticipate at all, a kind of global history, a world history uh, from antiquity to the present, viewed through the lens of travel documents. I got a little bit out of my depth, in other words, <laughs> as I was doing this. But fortunately, and, and the director of my school is here, hi, Miriam. Um, I'm in this interdisciplinary unit where I can walk down the hall and find a classicist 
or a historian of some other period or a literary scholar of the 18th century or what have you, so I could confirm my suspicions with them. I could make sure I wasn't uh, making a fool of myself when I needed to. Um, so I was more grateful to have those colleagues uh, on board for the project. So many histories of the passport, whether scholarly treatises or journalistic pieces, and there's quite a lot of bad journalism about passports out there, um, locate the earliest references to travel documents in the Bible. The book of Nehemiah, which dates to 445 BCE, more or less, um, where the eponymous royal cup requests a letter of safe conduct from King Artaxerxes of Persia so that he may travel to Judea and help rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. But as I've tried to do throughout the entire book, I looked a little bit more closely, I probed a little bit deeper, and found that actually there are travel documents that far precede that instance. So tracing that genealogy back in time, I, I sought origins, as it were, but also the kind of emotional resonance that these documents have had in different contexts. Um, there again, my colleagues were very helpful in finding things that I would have not found on my own, most likely. So it turns out that the oldest documents of international relations that have come down to us today date all the way back to the mid-14th century BCE, the so-called Amarna tablets or Amarna letters, which include a document which is cataloged as EA30, which can be identified as the earliest surviving safe conduct path, so a millennium older than this other instance. It's a clay tablet inscribed with cuneiform characters. Uh, I tell the story of that document in some detail in the book. But I want to get back to that other instance from the Bible. So the document that is mentioned in the Old Testament is called Ahalmi in Amalite or Amiatuka in Old Persian. There's lots of things that I have trouble pronouncing in this book. That's how out of my depth I was at some points. Um, it served as a travel mit, uh, permit and also interesting, a kind of meal voucher for uh, travelers in the Persian Empire as early as the sixth century BCE. So I provide a history of these documents, how they were used for travel over royal roads and so forth. But then I turn back to the Bible and I'm gonna read a little bit from the book so my, my plan from here is to sort of set up a few readings from the book to give you a sense, I hope, of the, of the voice, but also of the method. <clears throat> so the book of Nehemiah tells us about something more than these practical matters. Living in exile as a high-ranking official in the court of King Artaxerxes, the sixth monarch of the Archimedes Empire, Nehemiah learns to his considerable alarm that the walls of Jerusalem have been knocked down and the Jewish inhabitants of the city have been thrust into great jeopardy. After several days of fasting and prayer, I'm sorry, did, were you raising your hand? Oh, no, sorry. <laughs> I'm happy to take questions at any point. Yeah. Um, after several days of fasting and prayer, the dismayed Israelite comes before Artaxerxes who inquires about the cause of his worry and what might be done to alleviate it. Nehemiah, uh, Nehemiah immediately lodges a request for the travel documents, which accompanies an appeal for the materials he will need to rebuild Jerusalem when he returns. This is quoting from the book of Nehemiah. I said to the king, if it pleases the king, let the letters be given to me for the governors of the region beyond the river, that they must permit me to pass through till I come to Judah. And a letter unto Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he may give me timber to make beams for the gates of the palace, which appertain to the house and for the wall of the city and for the house that I shall enter into. So what's perhaps most extraordinary about the request is that it's preceded by a lengthy prayer to God that receiving heartfelt repentance from Nehemiah for the sins of the Israelites, he might grant the exile favor in the presence of King Artaxerxes. So the utterly remarkable fact is that the Israelite does not appeal to God directly for safe passage through the region beyond the river, uh, that is the west of the Euphrates, but rather for help in securing a letter of safe passage expressing the temporal authority of the Archimedes sovereign. So the book of Nehemiah also testifies to the emotional energies that circulate around the letter of safe conduct. So I do a bit of genealogical and textual analysis of the book of Nehemiah 
in my book. And I come to this. It is generally agreed that the early and late chapters, which present the action in an animated first person voice, are based on the memoirs of a historical figure named Nehemiah. And it's undeniable that as the narrator relays his own story, he provides these sections of the text with a rapt immediacy. As he tells it, I was very sore afraid when approaching Artaxerxes with his request. And the Israelite both exclaimed, let the king live forever and prayed to God, the God of heaven, one last time before lodging his request with the sovereign. When his passport request is granted, the overwrought Nehemiah identifies it with evident relief as a sign that the good hand of God is upon me. So a little bit about my method here. So I've attempted to trace various trajectories through the history of the past, what points of contact, overlap, and so forth in the historical record, including connections between the distant past and our own moment. I see this as a way of getting at certain conceptual insights, abstractions, as it were, via narrative. I also see it as a means to tell the story of the present in a compelling way. So as important as the early reference to travel documentation has been to scholars and journalists, as compelling as the emotional revelations of the desperate exile has been for readers of the Bible, the book of Nehemiah is perhaps more important to the history of the passport for what it tells us about ancient conceptions of citizenship. So I demonstrate this in the book. I'll give just a, a brief synopsis here. Nehemiah returns home to the city of his ancestors in the hope of rebuilding its walls and restoring the community to its former integrity. He institutes a series of social and liturgical reforms that are designed to unite the community and protect it against its enemies, both internal and external. He even plans a census for the inhabitants of Jerusalem and establishes a register of genealogy. In the process, and biblical scholars have noted this often enough, he establishes a form of citizenship based on both the celebration of common bonds and the recognition of communal laws. But this conception, and this is something that has also often been noted, is dependent on excluding others beyond the walls of the city. So after discussing the book of Nehemiah in some detail, I turn to this more contemporary uh, instance. Commentators up to our own time have seized upon this unfortunate chauvinism to promulgate their own ideas of citizenship. When just hours before the inauguration of Donald J. Trump on January 20th, 2017, the agitational Southern Baptist pastor, Robert Jeffress, deli delivered a sermon at St. John's Episcopal Church in Washington, DC. You'll remember that historical landmark, which was later the site of a rather infamous photo op with the Bible brandishing president. He called on the book of Nehemiah to reaffirm that God is not against building walls. Speaking directly to Trump, who sat there in the front pew, <coughs> Jeffress enthusiastically summoned the biblical figure. When I think of you, President-elect Trump, I am reminded of another great leader God chose thousands of years ago in Israel. The pastor, known for his boyish smile, went on to announce cheerfully that the first step to rebuilding the community in Jerusalem was for Nehemiah to reconstruct the Great Wall around the city, which he succeeded in doing, according to Jeffress, because he refused to bow to his critics or to allow the disapproval of his own citizens to deter him. So I, I make these transits back and forth across history a number of times in the book. Um, and I was talking with Ron about this earlier. A lot of these connections came to me if we're talking about uh, the writing process while I was hiking or biking or walking or otherwise not thinking about the book. <laughs> And this stuff would percolate up. And I said, oh, what if I think about those things together? And those juxtapositions often help me to articulate the, the knottier, the more tangled concepts uh, in the book. So um, I, I highly recommend letting your subconscious do as much of the work as possible. It, it turns to, tends to work out well. OK, so uh, another one of those juxtapositions then. Um, let me move on to. Our next slide here with old Herman Melville. So several chapters later, uh, I tell the story of uh, Herman Melville's passport applications, a number of them, which demonstrate several things. 
He shows us something about the bureaucratic hurdles faced by would-be passport holders in the 19th century. Melville, it turns out, and there's a great article about this by Stephen Olson Smith and Herschel Parker that I draw on in the book. It turns out he was a great procrastinator and he caused himself all sorts of undue stress because he would delay writing his letters of application until the very last minute before he was due to sail. It also seems uh, that he was a great exaggerator, maybe not a surprise from the author of Moby Dick, who indicated his own height in rather changeable ways across various passport applications over the years. But beyond whatever these applications might tell us about the man, about Herman Melville, they also indicate something about the status of the passport as an identification document during this period, when its efficacy depended on rather uh, depended on accurately recording the physical details read off the surface of the body and translated into categorical descriptions. So this is before the use of photography in these documents, and you, you can see actually the descriptors that Herman provided there. I'll, I'll read them off for you so you can get a sense of this. So in addition to his height, he recorded his eyes as blue, his hair as dark brown, his mouth as medium, his nose as medium prominent, his complexion is fair, age 30 years old, forehead also medium, chin ordinary, and face oval. So you know, immediately recognizable as the man himself, right? <laughs> After receiving Melville's letter of application, this, this early one from 1849, a clerk in the Secretary of State's office responded with a request to provide proof of citizenship. This was a new requirement just on the books at the time. So the documentation of individual identity came to be valued as fundamental to the recognition and representation, sorry, to recognition and representation in emerging nation states where personal encounters and communal ties could no longer be relied upon as establishing, means of establishing belonging. The request to Melville resulted in an affidavit written and signed by his younger brother, Alan, who had recently been called to the New York bar, very convenient, uh, and now swore that to the best of his knowledge, Herman's claim of citizenship was true. So this is interesting uh, in its own right, but I think even more so when we consider one of Melville's contemporaries, Frederick Douglass. The relative ease with which Melville was able to establish his citizenship and thus to acquire a passport stands in clear contrast to the experience of his contemporary, Frederick Douglass who escaped slavery with identification documents borrowed from a free black sailor, a dramatic episode that I tell in some detail in the book. But skipping ahead a little bit, long after he secured his freedom, Douglas was still unable to obtain an official US passport. In 1859, he had applied for a passport by writing the US minister to the United Kingdom. And I'll read a little bit from the book on that matter. But as Douglas later recounted, and this, these are Douglas's words, true to the traditions of the Democratic Party, true to the slaveholding policy of his country, true to the decision of the United States Supreme Court, and true perhaps to the petty meanness of his own nature, Mr. George M. Dallas, the Democratic American minister, refused to grant me a passport on the ground I was not a citizen of the United States. Two years earlier, historians in the crowd will know this. In 1857, the Dred Scott case had ruled that African Americans, whether free or enslaved, were not included and were not intended to be included under the word citizens in the Constitution and could therefore claim none of the rights and privileges which that instrument provides for and secures to citizens of the United States. Of course, those rights and privileges included the right to a passport. But I like this story because Douglas has the last word. On August 24th, 1886, in anticipation of a honeymoon journey with his second wife, uh, Douglas, that iconic American, completed a passport application in Washington, D.C., swearing that he was born in the state of Maryland. This is the document I have up here. And that he was a native and loyal citizen of the United States about to travel abroad. For Douglas, more than a quarter century later, the document was nonetheless significant. In the life and times of Frederick Douglass, his 1892 biography, he makes it clear that as he prepared for his honeymoon in Europe, he still agonizingly recalled the occasion many years before when George M. Dallas, and this is quoting Douglas, refused to give me a passport on the ground that I was not and could not be an American citizen. 
this, this man is now dead and generally forgotten, as I shall be, but I have lived to see myself everywhere recognized an American citizen. In fact, he was able to swear to his own citizenship in this document because he was well known enough to do so. The passport he would receive in 1886, the first that he ever possessed, was yet another affirmation of that hard-won hard status. The fact that the passport was a symbol of citizenship more than a necessity for travel did little to diminish the sense of freedom that it afforded Douglas. After describing the acquisition of the passport, he writes movingly of his long-standing wanderlust. I had strange dreams of travel even my boyhood days, he says. I thought I should someday see many of the famous places of which I heard men speak and of which I read even while a slave. Now, in the company of his new partner and in possession of his new document, he could finally embark on his grand tour. Douglas left the, um, empty the blank on the passport application uh, where the destinations were to be indicated. Not because the document would go unused, but because the itinerary was open-ended. From this follows one of my favorite passages in the book where I describe his travels, this grand tour that he took beginning in France and making his way to Egypt. <clears throat> so between Paris and the pyramids, he would repeatedly observe uh, what he saw in the old world and compare it to what he knew so well of American ideals, values, and aspirations, but he never again mentions his passport. Okay, so now on to my last example. In the second half of the book, I discuss the emergence of the modern passport, the passport as we know it, that's the phrase I use, uh, <clears throat> during the First World War. Its role in the refugee crises brought on by the Second World War and much, much more, frankly. But in the closing chapters, I bring the story of these documents to our current refugee crises. So let me pick up a from a couple of paragraphs into chapter six of the book, where I discuss Ai Weiwei's 2017 documentary, Human Flow. At the halfway point of the film, the Chinese distant artist turned documentarian enters a refugee camp in Inomenin on the Greek-Macedonian border, where his uh, camera observes the daily rituals of physical survival, men ducking out of the rain into small nylon tents, mothers and children huddling together to stay warm, inhabitants of the camp cooking over a makeshift campfire, others gathering firewood and root vegetables near the fence line. His microphones capture the sounds of feet trudging through the mud mixed with the rapid com mixed with rapid conversations in Arabic and the rasping coughs of those suffering in the rain, mist, and cold. I wanders through the camp, making conversation and filming other quotidian activities. Then the shot cuts through the grinning face of a migrant man who is surrounded by a crowd of other migrants, hooded against the rain, some smiling broadly, some simply bemused. The man begins to unzip his heavy coat as we hear Ai Wei off screen, Ai Wei Wei. So this is just about 60 seconds, so I'll play it for you. So this exchange amounts to a devastating parody of the passport control ritual. Here, rather than inspecting the document and interrogating the holder in order to assess his threat to the host nation, I offers a gesture of radical hospitality in the form of his own passport, his own identity, his own citizenship. So I, I go on to discuss the camp setting in relation to Giorgio Agamben's well-known concept of bear life, which I trace through the entire book, in fact but I'll pick up here a few paragraphs later. 
<clears throat> the camp setting thus contributes a plaintive, nearly tragic tone to the scene played out by I and Mahmoud. If only one's identity, one's belonging, one's status before the law could be so easily transferred from one's body to that of another. If only the world famous artist could take the place of the desperate migrant. If only the accident of their birth in China or Syria could be reversed, undone. If only the fictions of borders and nations that circumscribe the lives of migrants could be recast in another fiction. So next time, you're Ai Weiwei and I'm Mahmoud. I'll take your worthless passport, you take the one that grants you recognition, mobility, and a future beyond the fate of a discarded migrant, an unwanted refugee. So I go on to analyze this scene and its ethical implications in much greater detail, but suffice it to say that this is a good example of how I approach writing for a broader audience. How I've approached, if you like, making a case for the value of the humanities for that audience. I've sought out stories from literature, film, philosophy, politics, and elsewhere that bring us towards certain insights that help us to understand complex ideas or broader historical phenomena, but do so in an intimate human way and on an intimate human scale. In this way, I've also tried to imagine a readership defined by curiosity about my subject who might follow me into these thorny historical and conceptual places as long as I make a good faith effort to guide them there. It turns out the passports precisely because they tend to generate interesting stories, which alternate between travel writing and personal memoir, provide an incisive means to reflect on broader themes of cultural and political history. Passports, of course, may be viewed as just everyday documents or bureaucratic necessities, but as I've tried to show, they have a fascinating history and an outsized personal and political significance. So writing this book, writing License to Travel, was a process of trying to draw out the significance for my readers and hoping that it resonates with them. I'll stop there. So uh, Patrick, can we take a few questions? Sure, absolutely. I need more Instagram followers, so. I tried to get my 17-year-old daughter to be my social media manager, and she refused. So I'm limping along with my current arrangement. <laughs> because Aubrey is something you were filing first. Yes, I've tried. I'm, I'm helping her write her college exams right now, her college essays for for applications yeah. right now. That seems like it should be enough. <laughs> You're probably helping her her whole life, though, right? Yeah. I do feel like I've built up a certain amount of credit with her by now, after 17 years, yeah. <laughs> so you had mentioned at the beginning um, the trace where we're going, and yet you, you took us up to 2016. Mm -hmm. um, I, I've read the book yet, apologies, um, I want to. Um, but can you summarize either what you say in the book or where you think this is taking us? Well, I, I, I don't have a crystal ball, but I do kind of project into the future a bit um, in, in a couple of different ways. Um, one, by looking at uh, a dance piece, actually a piece of choreography, um, and also the design of some contemporary passports to think about what's called the mobility gap that is, the, the difference between the most powerful passports and the least powerful passports, the most powerful being those that allow visa-free travel to the most countries. So the, these days, a UAE passport happens to be the most powerful. We'll get you into 180, 181 out of 193 recognized UN countries and territories, while uh, an Afghanistan or Afghani passport, a Syrian passport, the number is more like 39 or 40. So um, that doesn't seem to be likely to change anytime soon, but there is certainly a demand for that to change. It will require international cooperation in a way that we haven't seen, at least not since you know, right after the First World War, say. Um, and I also look at the sort of technological transformations of our travel documents, um, the ways that uh, biometric data blockchain technology, smartphone apps, and so forth are being used for the control of migration now. 
and the, the likely outcomes of that. It will probably be the case in a decade none of us have a, a paper passport. We'll all be using our phones for that purpose. Um, and the, the, I hope it's not a cop out, but the way that I end the book is that whatever our geopolitics is to be, the passport is going to play an important role there. The migrant crises that we've been experiencing for the last decade are not going away. And um, the passport is right at the center of those. And you know, as people seek safety, economic opportunity, and all the other reasons they migrate, the passport is you know, right at the center of those concerns. As, as a US passport holder, I tend to think of my passport in rather romantic terms. It reminds me of places I've been and places I want to go and things like that. But I've talked to a lot of people about their passports over the last few years writing this book and, and after. And for people in many parts of the world, the passport is a burden. It's an obstacle. It's, it's an anchor keeping them where they are rather than allowing for the freedom of movement. So um, the passport will continue to be a place where we think through it's a site, it's an object where those issues come together. Yes? A couple of things uh, well, about internal passports. Like in Russia, where they have uh, internal passports required, and the nationality of people is put there, but interestingly enough, your family could have been there for hundreds of years. If you're Jewish, it says you're Jewish and not Russian. Hmm. You can see where that goes uh, in terms of the. Uh, and the thing I was also thinking about on the other end of it, I'm thinking of passports being included, embedded in your skin or using the uh, lens of your eye to identify who you are. Then it would be virtually impossible to have any fraud with passports anymore. Yeah, well, there's, so there's an interesting confluence of those two things actually in Russia in the 19th century when serfs would uh, leave the um, property of their overlords, they would be required to have an internal passport. If they were caught without that passport, they would be branded with a B, which would indicate that they were vagrants or otherwise you know, off, off the reservation uh, where they shouldn't be uh, in a way that was permanent and would always mark them out as someone who's transgressed that uh, restriction. I believe that the uh Serfs were fairly emancipated in 1865, I believe. Right. And uh, so after that, I guess it wasn't. Uh, but these were always still had their hands. Even even after that, there were similar restrictions. Yeah. But they also have. Uh, they've, they've had the Soviet Union and Russia. I don't know if before the Soviet Union they had the uh, the basketball. Maybe it was a continuation of that. Yeah. Well, they they, they are still used there, and that's a variation on this for sure. Although, of course, it's to control internal movement rather than movement across borders. Uh, could you speak to, uh, I don't know, the, the issue that the, the previous question raised in a different way, like uh, the, the presumption that these documents are authentic and efforts to get around that. And that seems to be like a kind of parallel history to the history of the, um, yeah. of the object is the history to Make Fakes, forgeries, and yeah. so forth. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's part of the story that I tell in the book. It is an important element of this. Yeah. Well, uh, there's parallels in monetary. Uh, with money, uh, we're always trying to make fake money, and the same. It's probably done the same amount of time. That would have uh, both uh, requirements. I think there would be uh, the um, forgery of of money and the uh, forgery of uh, travel documents. Well, in, in just to talk about today, this uh, mobility gap generates a lot of fraud, a lot of uh, efforts to circumvent the international system to, to buy fake documents so that one can move more easily. But there's, there's a fascinating history of what are called para-passports sometimes, which can be used for those sorts of purposes. But they're also used, for instance, for uh, indigenous nations to assert their own sovereignty. So there's examples in North America, there's examples in Australia of indigenous nations issuing uh, passports which aren't recognized by the international community or the nation state in which their community is to be found, but they have this symbolic purpose and people have uh, you know, intentionally you know, risked their freedom by traveling with those documents as a way of exerting or emphasizing their own sovereignty. 
So yeah, the, the, the story is, is a, a very detailed and complex one with these kinds of documents. Another one that, that is quite famous is the so-called World Passport, which uh, is issued by an organization called the World Service Authority. I went and got a couple of these fake passports myself as part of my research. Um, this was an organization founded uh, shortly after the Second World War by an American who had um, walked into the uh, UN grounds in Paris and declared himself a man without a country because he um, had been part of bombing missions over Dresden during the war and he saw the uh, war as the outcome of the internecine relations between nation states and wanted nothing to do with it afterwards. Um, and so he founded this organization which was a kind of parallel to the UN but without the official recognition or status and began issuing these documents and, and it, the, in fact they're still issuing them so 70 years later or more now. Um, and they have been used actually in some cases to cross borders. They're issued to uh, refugee uh, communities. They're re they're, they actually issued one to, um, to Barack Obama, to Edward Snowden, and so forth, you know, to sort of raise uh, uh, media attention about these things. Um, yeah, so there's, there's this kind of, as you say, parallel history of false documents uh, that uh, play on the, those three functions of the passport that I enumerated at the beginning, but in ways that are meant to circumvent the authority of the nation state in one way or another. Yes? Thank you for your talk. The book sounds wonderful. I wonder, um, how did you define the parameters of your topic? Because it seems very large, and you yes. described a few sort of rabbit holes that you've been down. How did you decide what was going to be included and how you could see it as completed for the purpose that you know? Well, that, that was maybe the most difficult thing about writing the book because as I researched it, I kept finding more and more interesting stories, more and more examples of para passports and internal passports and so on and so forth. So I tried to find representative examples of these other kinds of documents and those earlier documents that precede the modern passport um, that also had interesting stories attached to them. And that was the principle of selection in many cases. So I, the work is fairly systematic, I think. It's fairly comprehensive in covering these things, although I give short shrift to those things that don't have interesting stories attached to them and more attention to those that do. But those stories, because they highlight the sort of emotional and Im imaginative response that passport holders have had to those documents, I think are illustrative in, in, in ways that are particularly important for the project. Um, the other answer to that question is I have enough material left over for another book if I ever get around <laughs> to it because, yeah, the, the, the stories multiply, for sure. There you go. So I'm wondering if, um, I know you've traveled a bit since you wrote the book and if your relationship to your own passport um, shifts or if those moments of displaying it are um, forever changed for you? Well, certainly I pay close attention to those moments. I, th I think about that and I watch others um, when I'm you know, going through customs and immigration. And I've, and I've been in the midst of some interesting examples of this. So you know, after Brexit, running into Brits in Europe who had to wait in line with me instead of the other EU citizens and were not too happy about it, things like that. Um, I don't know how much I should admit about this, but I managed to lose a passport after I wrote this book. You'd think that I'd be the last person to do that. I found it, but I had to drive 500 miles to get it. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I am still an absent-minded professor, apparently, even though I think about passports a lot. And um, what, one thing, I don't know if it's changed my own feelings about my passport too much, but I've learned so much from other people once they you know, hear I've written a book about the passport, they want to tell me their passport stories. And I, that's another you know, source of a, a book, perhaps, all the things that people have told me about their experiences, good and bad, with their travel documents. 
Yes. Yeah, so I, I'm just curious, I really don't know, but I want to. Um, like in World War One, World War Two, when masks of US you know, soldiers got shipped into Europe, I, I'm assuming they didn't have passports. And the same question for Korea and Vietnam. Nowadays, they do need passports. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think those invasions would have been passportless. Yeah, and, and the passport, use of passports sort of waned at the end of the 19th century until the beginning of the First World War, and it was only with the beginning of that conflict that concerns about espionage and so forth reignited the use of passports, and then after, shortly after the war with the foundation of, of the League of Nations, passports were formalized for the first time. They had to be the same size, same format, and so forth. So they wouldn't have been a requirement during the First World War. I'm sure they weren't during the Second World War because you know, of the, the general crisis going on. Um, but one of the interesting things about the modern passport is that it is a product of warfare. It is a product of the crisis of the international regime and individual nation states. And it has that sort of martial uh, history written into it. I mean, the reason that we are tracked so closely stems from that first global war. Well, uh, please uh, join me in thanking Patrick once again for a wonderful talk.